Good evening and welcome to the Contend for Your Faith Bible Study series. Join us tonight as we delve into the book of John. Hi, I'm Nathan Pearl. Welcome to the Contend for Your Faith, Faith Bible Study series. Tonight I have with me Bob Slayman. And sadly, Greg's not going to be joining us. The, uh, he just moved and his internet's not functioning quite right. Okay, before we get started, I want to talk a little bit about why we're here, what this is all about. It is my conviction that each member of the church, each saint of God, as it says to Jude, he says, saints, I write unto you. Paul addresses the saints. He says, saints, this is what I'm asking you to do. Take the gospel out. Paul says, Lay aside every sin and weight which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that's set before us. That's not just the apostles, that's each and every member of the church. So it is my conviction that, that all of us should be on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis contending for what we believe. We should be contending with people that, that creep in silently with lascivious doctrines, things that, that should not be part of the church. Things like Jesus isn't God. Things like Jesus didn't come in the flesh. He only came in the spirit. Things like uh, that homosexuality is an acceptable alternate lifestyle. And, and as these things creep into the church, we ought to be able to stand up and say, no, no, it's not, and this is why. This, I don't believe that, and this is why I don't believe that. Let me show you the verse. Let me show you the chapter. Let's look into this further. And so the reason that we're doing this is to empower you, to give you the tools that you need to be able to take those, those things as they come at you and to adequately uh, uh, contend for it, to, to acquit you with the tools that you need to be a knight in this kingdom, to be a soldier, to be a, an athlete, to step out and to contend for what you believe. But not just with church members, not just with with religious people, not just with people who call themselves saints. Furthermore, I, would, I want to acquit you with the tools that you need to sit down on the airplane next to somebody and to give them the gospel, to sit down on the bus, to go to the office with somebody, to talk to somebody at work, to uh, go to the, uh, the park and to tell somebody about Jesus. To, to stand on a street corner and to preach it out. I'm not advocating one thing over another. I'm just saying work. Do it. Tell somebody. Be a witness. Not a silent witness. Be a vocal witness for God, for what he has to, to offer. Now, Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is a power unto salvation. The message that we have is so powerful. It's so all-encompassing. It can take a drunk off the street and set him on his feet, deliver him from alcohol, deliver him from slothfulness, clean up his mind, renew his mind, renew his body, and, and make him a, a functioning child of God, a reproducing Christian. The message that we have can take a religious man, a Catholic priest, and can deliver him from that religion, can deliver him from the bondage of the law, and can give him a, a blessed hope unto salvation that is, that is beyond speakable. It's, it's, it's something that he could never achieve outside. It, it's not a doctrine. It's a living thing. It's something that is, that is a, a work that God does in us. Now, with that kind of message... We want to be the mes best messengers we can. We want to be the most effective, the most uh, outspoken, the, mo the best spoken, uh, say it the clearest, articulate it the best. We want to be everything that we can be because we love Christ and we want to be able to share what he's given. We want to be able to share what he's done to us. But uh, we're not. We're not always the best. We, we often stumble over words, if you, especially if you get in front of a camera. But 
uh, it's, it's real easy to start talking to somebody and for everything to fly out of your head. All the verses that you've memorized, uh, oh, now, now they're all gone. So you say, well, I can't do it. Because every time I start to give somebody the gospel or, or I say, you know what, let me tell you about what Christ has done for me. And they go, okay, well, what's that? Well, I, 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 and you freeze up. Well, we want to get some practice so we don't do that. But you have to understand that it's not your ability to give the message. It's the message that has power. There's a young lady around here, and, and we, did this, we did this practice thing to get better where we would pose a question and say, okay, I'm so-and-so on the street and I ask you this, how do you answer it? And there's a young lady that, that had one answer for everything, and I just loved it. And it was, let me tell you what God's done for me. And, and then a testimony. God saved me. He saved me. He came into my life and he made me a new creature. Well, you can't argue with that. That's a, fan, that's a phenomenal, powerful thing to tell somebody. If somebody says, Nathan, what's, what's the best vehicle for my young family? Well, I could go on about this vehicle or that vehicle, or I could just say, well, this is the one I've got, and this is what it's done for me. It's worked good. You can't argue with that. You can't pull up numbers and, and say, well, Consumer Report says or this. I say, you know what? This is how much money it's cost me, and I have a personal testimony. You can't argue with my testimony because it's mine. It's not an open format. It's not, it's not everybody's. It's my testimony. Well, you can just give your testimony. That's powerful. That's powerful to say, I was lost and I'm not anymore. So we want to, that's where we're coming from. We want to take all this stuff. This is all tools that we're trying to give you so that you can better acquit yourself of the of the the testimony of the gospel now that's that was for free that was my intro okay the uh the thing that we usually do here is we talk about news and usually greg does this for me and there was something this week that was so striking on the news to me it just it got that i i want to go ahead and, and do this even though i i don't really have something prepared for it but there was a I, I watched this thing on 2020, and they were blasting uh, Independent Baptist for this thing, and rightfully so. And there were some people in there that that my wife knew, and there was a young lady that was in particular that was molested by her by her stepfather, and then uh, she went to church and told her youth pastor, and then her youth pastor said, "Okay, it's uh, and so had you, her youth pastor molested her, and uh, it's a horrible horrible thing to have happen." And uh, they, they it came out in the news, and as it did, uh, 2020 was talking about what they called independent fundamental Baptist Christians and how awful they are. And they went through and said they believe this and they believe this, and they uh, uh, believe in this hierarchy of power. And a lot of the things that they were talking about, I agree with them on. Uh, stuff like uh, that women are, are second place. Uh, I agree with 2020, not the, I, not the independent Baptist. The, uh, Bob doesn't, but uh, no, um, that, uh, you know, a, a lot of people will teach that, um, that there's God and man and woman and children when that's not the hierarchy, the way it's teach, taught in Ephesians is there's God and then the husband and then the wife. And the wife is subject under her husband, but she's not subject under, under the other husband or the other man in the church or under the pastor or anybody else. When it, outside of the marital relationship, she is no different than any other brother in Christ. There are certain things she's not to teach or usurp authority in the church, but there's a lot of men that shouldn't teach or usurp authority, according to Titus and according to Peter and other places, that should not be teaching or usurping authority in the church. So uh, there, there are problems with this, this what they were calling the, the IFB, the Independent Fundamental Baptist. But the way they said it was they were like, these people are fundamentalist. Ah. Uh. And I thought, man, that's irritating to me. That they can take and just brand somebody and go, you are a 
fundamentalist. So you believe that, that you know, you ought to kill people or something. Like it's a real bad thing that you're a fundamentalist. And I thought, how did they get that from me? How did they take something that you should wear as a badge of honor? Do, do you know where the word fundamentalist came from? Where it started getting used? In the uh, late 20th century, when the Industrial Revolution took off, people like H.G. Wells and, and uh, right after um, uh, Father of Evolution, uh, Darwin. Darwin, right after Darwin wrote his book and, and all that, there was this move towards, Jared's laughing at me for not knowing who Darwin is, there was this move towards uh, what they called modernism. And there was a, you know what, uh, re religious people are stupid because they don't understand that we got evolved and this and that. And there was this move towards, yeah, uh, there's a God, but, but uh, you know, a lot of this stuff isn't true or it's not quite right. And we need to redefine religion with science. We need to redefine religion with, with social agenda. And really, the, the modernist movement start with redefining religion with, with science and taking and applying science to religion and using the science to filter the Word of God. Well, then these people came along that were fundamentalist. And they said, you know what? There is no greater authority. There is no higher authority than the Word of God. That's, that is our authority. And if science disagrees with the word of God, science is wrong. And they laughed and said, ha, 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 you just don't understand that it all started with a simple cell and it evolved. And the fundamentalist said, no, you don't understand. The Bible says God created it. Well, as it turns out, the simple cell theory didn't work because there's no such thing as a simple cell. Simple cell has 200 different parts to it that all have to be present for the thing to work. It's not simple at all. So, it, as it turns out, the Bible was ratified. It was the one that was, that was right. It was the one that, that, that you could turn to and go, okay, it was right and you were wrong, but somehow the modernists were able to usurp the authority that should be had with the Word of God and to change it so that then you say, oh, you're a fundamentalist. You just don't, you just don't have the education. You just don't have, you're not suave. You don't have the... Uh, the modernist idea, you are just stuck on this Bible and this, these theories of, of, of law and truth, and you, and you don't take the relativism that's here. And then we have the postmodernist era. You hear that, you hear that a lot, the postmodernists. Well, that's after these guys came along, and now we're going to redefine it with a social agenda. You say, well, homosexuality is an alternate lifestyle. How do you know that? Because everybody accepts that that's the truth. Okay, but Romans doesn't say that. Peter doesn't say that. Genesis doesn't say that. So where do you get your authority? Well, I get it from the masses. I mean, everybody says so. So truth is, is, is structured, is, is brought from, truth is, is pulled out of society. When has society ever been right? When has the world at large ever been right? Noah, everybody says that you're not doing the right thing. You don't need to build an ark. You're a fundamentalist. You think that just because you got word from God that there's a flood coming, that you're right and everybody else is wrong. That is so arrogant, no, Noah. You are just not enlightened the way the rest of us are. See, the rest of us, we're going to eat, drink, and be merry because that feels good. It's what we like. We're going to indulge in the flesh day after day. And you just, you just are so fundamental. And then they all died in a big flood because Noah had it right, and they didn't. Well, maybe you don't believe in the flood. Here's the difference between a fundamentalist and a modernist, postmodernist, socialist. Here's the difference. A fundamentalist holds up an authority outside, greater than himself, or any other authority. He holds up an authority and says, I don't care what's socially correct. I don't care what's politically correct. I don't care if I offend you. 
I don't care because it's not my law. It's not my authority. It's not my rules. It's, it's God's rules. And that's true in any society. Well, what, you, what about the uh, Muslim fundamentalist? What do the Muslim fundamentalists do? They take Islam, they take the, the core of Islam, and they stand on it and they say, where the Quran teaches that you need to kill non-believers, we, we're going to hold on to that. We're going to do that. They're following the Quran to the letter of the law. The other people are politicizing, and, and not to say that the ones that kill people are better. I like the ones that are modernist and things because they don't kill people. But uh, the, the, the fundamentals are the ones that get back and say, no, we're not going to go by what everybody else likes. We're going by this law, by this thing. Now, as I was considering these things, I asked myself, what is the difference then between a fundamental Muslim and a fundamental Christian? Somebody that says, I am standing on the fundamentals. If you are a fundamentalist Christian, the basis for your actions toward your fellow man is love. Do you realize that? If you are a fundamentalist and you stand, you say, I will, I will stand on the word of God and I shall not be moved. I'm going to stand here. The foundation that you're standing on is a foundation built on love. It is built on loving your fellow man and seeking their well-being in eternity. Now, it is not built on making all your fellow men and women comfortable. It's not built on an idea or foundation of political acceptance or acceptance by the masses. Noah acted in love by standing on a half-finished ark preaching righteousness. Repent of your sins or you're going to drown and die. That's love. That's true love because he was hated for that message. John the Baptist acted in love, telling people, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's love. You said that the difference between a fundamental Christian and a fundamental, uh, what was the Islamist? Muslim. Muslim <clears throat> was love. Well, they will do what, what they're supposed to do because they love Allah. But the difference is they love Allah, and the way they dis display that is by uh, wiping out all the Christians and Jews. Um, right? Yeah. Now, the, uh, I am not, I, I, I have not studied Islam. Uh, what I know about Islam, I know by the Cliff Notes version that you can download on, on the internet, look at. Um, but it is my understanding that Islam and the ones that I've heard preach, because that's fascinating. I've watched it on TV some when I, whenever I'm in a hotel and find it. It is my understanding that it is, uh, that it is not based on an idea of love for your fellow man, but it is based on a, you accept this, or we are your enemy. Yeah. I am not an enemy with everybody else that I'm around. I'm not an, if I meet a, a homosexual in the street, I'm not his enemy. God is his enemy. I am God's ambassador to give him the good news. Mr. You, I guess you can call him Mr. <laughs> Thingy, you can <laughs> repent of your sin. You can turn from your unrighteousness. You can embrace the love of God and the law of God, and God can renew your mind and you can become a virtuous, righteous man. That's my message. That's a message of love. I, I'm, not, I'm not here to, to, to hate you. Now, I'm not going to not bring condemnation. I'm not going to say, no, homosexuality is cool, man. It's all fine. Just love, love God and everything. No, no, that's not, the me that's not the message God's giving. That's not acting in love. That's acting in, in selfishness because I'm trying to get him to like me. If I'm going to act in love, I'm going to go, you know what? God died for your sin, your putrid, disgusting, <laughs> filthy sin. God died for it, man, just like he died for mine. Just like he, he saved me from, from all the sins that I've committed. He, he redeemed me. He washed me in his blood. He'll wash you in, in his blood, and, and you, will be, you will be born again. That's a message of love. And it's, it's not a message that's readily received because it very clearly yeah. draws lines. 
it very clearly says and I'm the, here and you're there. The news media, 2020 or whatever you're watching, it, they're always against Christians, especially the ones that are right. You know, not that all Baptists are right, but man, when you are such a mind. If you're an independent Baptist, you have your own set of problems. I know, but man, you you are the minority, man. If you st- if you say Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven, if you don't repent and get saved and trust Christ, you're gonna burn in hell forever. If you, if you believe that, you are like such a minority minority, and everybody thinks you're just a freak. And you don't have to proclaim it on the street. You can just say that's what I believe over a cup of coffee. On, automatically, you're a weirdo. On this, the sh- video that I saw yeah. that I, I watched on the internet, the lady had a, an, an independent Baptist pastor there, and she goes, so you think that everybody that doesn't believe, she says, I'm a Catholic, like you and do. you think everybody that doesn't believe like you do yeah. is going to hell? Yeah. You think I'm going to hell? Yeah. She looks at the camera and goes, <laughs> <laughs> And I thought, that's the reason that the guys in the mega churches don't say it. That's right. Because that's the way they'd get treated. And their message is a message of, po- of politics. It's a message of in- inclusive, inclusivisms. Um, and my message is not, my message is the message that God gives me. And my message is, look at the word of God. It's truth. I'm not. He, Jesus is the truth. I'm not the truth. I don't have the right or the the responsibility to, to say this is good, this is not good, and this is good. All I can do is open the Word of God and say this is what it says. Okay. Anything to add to that, Bob? Sounds good, Nathan. Let's okay. jump on in there. That got me kind of fired up this week. I, I have my wisdom teeth out, so if I talk with my jaw a little clenched, that's why. And uh, so I, I sat around stewing all week, so I had to get that off my chest. Okay. John chapter 1 and verse 15. Now last week we got through um, the first 15 verses of John or so. And John starts with this tempo. He says, this is who Jesus is. Jesus is God. This is why Jesus came. This is what Jesus did. Now this is another guy, John. This is, this is who John is. This is what John's here to do. And now in verse 15, we're going to get to the spot where, he, where uh, John is teaching, St. John is teaching what John the Baptist is saying. Now, the reason that he's doing this, he's not trying to articulate all of the message that John gave. And he's not trying to uh, give us any, in any way a, a uh, systematic teaching of a summary of these events. He's not trying to summarize the events and saying this happened and this happened and this happened and this happened. John has a message and if you remember the, the, the summation of the book is found in chapter 20 and verse 31 it says but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God and that believing ye might have life through his name. That's what John's teaching here. That is the focus of what he's teaching. He's not trying to tell us a story. The stories that he tells is trying to point us back to Jesus is the Christ. If you believe on him, you'll have life through his name. Now, when we get down into what John taught, he's going to hit the highlights of John's teaching in order to illustrate or or put a spotlight on his relationship to the Christ. I want, to, I want to read something in Luke chapter 1, uh, down in verse 76. And it says, And thou, child, shall be called the prophet of the highest. For thou, and this is, I'm sorry, this is Zacharias. This is John's father. And he's, and he's holding or looking at John the baby. He's just been born. He's there looking at him. And he says, And thou, child, shall be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins, through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us, to give light to them that sit in the darkness and, sh- and the shadow of death, to guide our feet unto the way of peace. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit and was in the desert till the day of his showing unto Israel. So John, as a babe, laying 
just brand new, newborn, his father stood over him and prophesied and said, this is what you're going to do. John goes off in the wilderness until the day of his showing, and John comes back. And I'm going to start in John chapter 1, verse 15. And John, bear witness of him, he's talking about Jesus, bear witness of him, and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Now this is John the Baptist here. John the not, Baptist Not talking. John That's the author right. who's writing here. John the Baptist. So this is John's message. He's bearing witness, saying, This is he of whom I spake. And he says, And of his fullness we all have all we received, and grace far grace. Now that's a very interesting verse, and you really can't get it unless you go back and look at the tempo of what John's teaching. John has said, Jesus is God. Jesus was born. Jesus that was born was God. He was with God. He was God. All things that were made were made by God, and without God, without Him was not anything made that was made. And, and, he's, and he's going and he's saying, Jesus is both God and man, and God and man are one in Jesus. That's the whole tempo of what he's doing. And so he gets down and he says, of his fullness, the fact that he is both God and man, of this fullness of Jesus Christ, we have, have all we received. So of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. Now, what he's talking about is, it says Jesus grew in, in grace and in uh, wisdom. And uh, Jesus, it says he was full of grace. It talks about Jesus being full of grace all the time. Jesus was, as God, full of grace. He was full of the of the Spirit of God and of that grace. And because of that, because of His fullness and the grace that was in Him, when He laid down His life, He was able to then redirect the grace, His grace, He was able to direct that at us. And so, and so for grace, which would be Jesus' life, grace, for grace, He gave us, He imputed that grace of His life to us. So the grace that he's talking about is the grace that is indelibly inside of Jesus, not the grace that we would speak of if we say we're saved by the grace of God. They're, they're 60, 40, the same thing, but, but it, is, it is talking specifically about where the grace that was in Christ, how that relates to our relationship with God. So another thing, the word for and grace for grace. First of all, like, boom, grace for grace. What, was he exchanging it here? What, what's, what's the deal, right? But the word for it can be clarified. Over in um, Acts chapter 2, in verse 38, it says, And Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Because your sins have been remitted and you're saved and you're already born again, get baptized because of. Okay, so the, the word for can loosely be translated, you know, because of, not necessarily um, the other sense of the word for. Does that make sense? Sure. Um, so you received grace because of the grace that was there. The, uh, if you look up for, which I've just done in the thesaurus, it, it has two different things. It says aimed at or on behalf of in lieu of, in place of, instead of, or intended for, designed for, meant for. So it could either be, and, and further than that, if we look at it, it means either in order to obtain, in order to get it, I'm going to the store yeah. for some Possession. eggs and milk, yeah. or it can mean, it can mean buy, uh, that I am, I am uh, not buy as in purchase, but it came by, uh, I, I went by for. Uh, you're, you go to jail because you stole. Because of. The reason of, I was jailed was for of, stealing. In order to obtain. Yeah. Because of is what I was trying to say. Right. By being because of. Okay. Um, now, verse 17. For the <laughs> law was given by Moses, but grace... And truth came by Jesus Christ. Now, 
This is one of my favorite passages because it's so, it's so clear, the message that the gospel is, is wrapped up in, this, in, in just a few words, grace and truth. It, that wraps up the gospel. I have some of it written on a chalkboard behind us. But what I want to do is, I, I sent, we have the PDF. I hope everyone's downloaded it. And in that, we have uh, the book of, in the book of Psalms, chapter 85, I have the, uh, the chapter broken down into the, uh, the verses, the, the um, um, linear uh, historical happenings, that are prophesied inside the book of Psalms. I mean, uh, the, the chapter of Psalms, order. the chronological order of. But it's 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 not just chronological, but the historical happening with the prophecy that David has. And the book of Psalms, chapter eighty-five, it's talking about the redemption that we that Israel has. But that same redemption carries over to the church, at least the last part of it. So go ahead. We're going to take a five minutes here to look at. Psalms chapter 85. Uh, if if some of it doesn't make sense, like I talk about, I talk about uh, the captivity of Israel, and and I take some things for granted that you understand a little bit of Ezra and Nehemiah and Daniel and Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel, and I'm sure you've read all those in the last two weeks. So, um, but but if you don't understand it, take some time to look some of those things up. But let's go ahead now and and. And open up the book of Psalms, chapter 85, and read that and see how it applies to uh, John chapter 1, verse 17. All right, we'll have a counter on the screen. Go ahead, Jerry.
And welcome back. I hope you enjoyed Psalms 85. It's a beautiful prophecy of, of the Christ and what he is to come. And the, uh, as Israel was uh, disobeyed God, and I have on there the, uh, the Ptolemy Empire and, and the way they, they kept fighting each other and, and smacking Israel around. And, and David says, Lord, how long is this going to take place? And then they get prepared for the Messiah, and the Messiah comes and gets cut off. And the last four or five verses there are basically, it's given the gospel. And I tell you what, I want to go back and look at those with you at those last four or five verses because I'm so excited about them. It says, mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Now, uh, we, we talked about this in, in John chapter 1, where he, where he says that, but what is he really talking about? Can we see the chalkboard back here? See how we have, on one side, we have all these things that God wants to grant us in his mercy. We have grace. God, God would love to give us that grace. We have mercy. God wants to give us mercy. We, he wants to be the justifier of us. He wants to love us, to treat us with love, not with, with uh, contention. He wants to have peace with us. But we can't have any of those things with God because of our sin. There's a wall between us and God that says that's sin. And because of this sin, God can't offer us His grace because God's righteous. And if God were to give us His grace with our sin still standing, then, then God wouldn't be righteous. How can a righteous judge give a guilty sinner grace he can't not and still be righteous the truth says the wages of sin is death the truth says the soul that sinneth it must die not that it should not that it could not that god will arbitrate it must die the soul that sinneth it is it has departed from the nature that god's given it it has it has bent itself and gone in a wrong direction and the soul that sinneth it must die God cannot have mercy because if he had mercy on a sinner, then God would violate the truth. And God cannot violate the truth and still be a righteous God because God cannot lie. God is truth, right? He wants to be the justifier of man. God wants to say, man, offer these sacrifices, do these things, and, and I will justify you to myself. But see, God's just. And if God's just... The wages of sin is the blood of man. It says that if the, the, that sin resides in a man, and the only sacrifice that's okay, that makes that okay, is an eternal separation and death for that soul. That's the only thing. So if God's going to be just, he cannot justify us. It's impossible and still be just. God is a God of love. God made Adam and put Adam in a garden and said, Adam, I've done it all. All I want you to do is pick the fruit and eat it. Enjoy it, all of it except one tree. I mean, there's all this beautiful fruit in the garden. It's, be it's paradise. It's, it's, it's perfect. You don't have to mow the grass. There's no bugs biting you. There's, there's no struggling for food. There's no pursuit in, in anything except pleasure. I've built all of it for your pleasure. I've given you a wife for, just so you guys can enjoy each other. Enjoy a godly relationship. And I want to come and talk to you every day. God is love. God, God is gracious and merciful and wonderful that he gave us that. But then we came along and violated the law. God said, don't eat of that fruit. But nope, we violated the law. So the love that God had, he, he had to obey the law because he's just, because he's truth, because he's righteousness. He has to obey the law. So he has to be separated from man. He has to kick man out of the garden. He said, the day you eat thereof, ye shall surely die. Let God be true and every man a liar. God cannot be forsworn on this. So the animals die and they're separated from the garden and their death starts that very day. Their separation from God starts that very day that they ate of that fruit. Because the law says, the day you eat thereof shall surely die. Should God violate the law? 
Should he be, you know what? Yeah, but I love you so much. I, I just, I love you. So I'm going to violate the law. And I'm going to be a sinner like you are and accept you. Because that's what God would be if he accepted a sinner. He would be unjust. He would be unlawful. He would be a sinner. And God can't do that. So God kicked him out. But God, it says he's the prince of peace. Right? God loves peace. God wants to be at peace with man. But we're at enmity with God because we violated the law. And because God is just, and since we violated the law, God has to be our enemy. Do you see? God cannot be other than our enemy. God has to say, you violated the law. I am the ultimate arbiter of truth because I am truth. I am the ultimate arbiter of righteousness because I am righteousness. Goodness is measured by my being, by who I am. What is righteousness? God is. Not that he does righteous. God is righteousness. What God does is righteousness. That is the standard that we have. And because of that, God must needs be at enmity with us because the truth says that if you, if you break the law and God is just, then righteousness demands that God be at enmity with you. And and these can't ever meet. They can never cross. You can never have grace and righteousness together. Because righteousness, as long as sin is present. Now before man came and put this big ugly piece of sin in the way, these were all perfectly meshed. These were, these were wonderful. Yes, God was gracious and righteousness and righteous. Sure, God had love. God had love and law. Don't eat of the fruit. You haven't eaten of the fruit. Enjoy all the other fruit. God had, God had peace with man. There was no enmity. God had peaceful. God had mercy on, day, on, on, on Adam and Eve. And God said, you know what? You don't have to do anything. I've provided it all. Not only have I done everything and provided everything, not only have I, I got everything ready for you, what I want you to do now is rest with me for what I've done. That, that is so merciful. That's so loving and kind and, and, and good and righteous and true and just and lawful. It's all together. And then we sin. And we marred the whole picture. It's broken now. It's, it's, it's eternally broken. Because, because you have to have grace and right. And right it, it won't, it's, it's done. It's over. How, what are we ever going to do? How are we ever going to bridge the gap? Animal sacrifices? No, that won't do it. An animals can, can put it off for a while, but the only thing you can do is go into the air conditioner in hell. You're still in Satan's domain. You're still, you're still, I mean, you're in a place of paradise because you love God, because you obeyed Him to an extent. You obeyed the sacrifice. You're still a sinner. You're still separated from God. And you know what? God's not there. God did not dwell in there with them. God wasn't there talking to them. He wasn't there spending time because they're sinners, because they're separated from God. So, so even though God hasn't damned them to eternal suffering, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Noah, Daniel, they're all stuck in Abraham's bosom. So what can we do? How can we ever bridge that gap? Well, what we need is somebody who's righteous, who's righteous, right? But we need somebody who's righteous, that can give us His grace, that's righteous and full of grace and full of mercy. Have, have you read the Gospels? You know who Jesus is? He's the Prince of Peace, right? This is, this is Jesus. You know who Jesus is? He's love, right? God is love. Jesus is love. You know who He is? He's the justifier. Jesus over here, oh, He's the justifier. And He's merciful. Isn't Jesus good? He's merciful. And you know what else? He's full of grace. So how do we bridge the gap? We bridge the gap through the death of Jesus. You see, when Jesus died, he bridged the gap. He went between and he was and he was in his justice. He was still just. In his mercy, he still had truth. 
Look back with us. Look back with us in the book of, of John. Actually, let's stay here in Psalms. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. How, how with this sin in the way, how can righteousness and peace, how, how are they going to meet? How are they going to kiss each other? How is this mercy on this side and truth over there, how is it going to meet together? It meets together in the body of Jesus Christ. Look at Bob wrote up here Psalms 520 or 2 Corinthians 521. It says that that he is God made him to be a sin for us. God made made him to be sin for us, him who he who knew no sin that he could reconcile us to himself. You see with this big wall of sin, reconciliation couldn't happen. God was at enmity with us. He was angry with us. He had to be because he's the judge, because it's righteous. Let's look in, uh, in Romans chapter 3. Turn with me to Romans chapter 3. If you let me talk very long, I always end up in Romans chapter 3. I love Romans chapter 3. Look down in, uh, let's start in 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all on this side over here. We all have fallen for the righteousness. We're under the law, but we're, we're all there. We're, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Verse 24. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God had set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say, at this time, His righteousness, that He might be, ready, just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. You see, God now, God is both just and the justifier. He has justified us justly. Do you understand that? That he has justly justified us without, without the death of Jesus Christ, without God making Jesus sin for us, then he couldn't be both the just and the justifier. Without God making him Jesus who knew no sin to be sin for us, he couldn't be righteous and have peace. He couldn't give us grace in, inside of the law. But Jesus didn't come to end the law. He fulfilled the law. You see, Jesus was righteous. He was truth. He was just. He was lawful. And he was always walked outside of enmity with God. He always walked with God with peace. So what was Jesus? Righteous, truth, peace, just, law, grace, mercy, justifier, love, and peace. He was all of it together. And in his death, taking my sin and your sin, he, he once again erases the boundary that is sin. He erases that boundary. And now they're all tied together again, just like they were with Adam. You know what we call him? The second Adam. You see how it all ties together? This is why I'm so excited about the Bible. This is why I'm so excited about the words of the Bible. Not just the meaning or the big picture, but the words Look at the words and you'll find that they mesh together. If he was called the Prince of Peace, it would totally mess up a whole doctrine that's in the Bible. I mean, if he was called the King of Peace, he's called the Prince of Peace for a reason. Yep. If he was called the, the King of Peace, it would totally mess it up. It wouldn't, it wouldn't work. But he's the Prince of Peace. Isn't that, isn't that beautiful? Uh, that's beautiful. I get a little excited about this stuff. Okay, let's go back to the book of John. And we are in verse 17. Now, from now on, when you read John chapter 1 and you get to verse 17, don't skip over it. When you get there, read it and stop and just, and just settle in and enjoy what Jesus has done for you. Enjoy the fact that that grace and truth have met together in the man Christ Jesus. 
John continues, No man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is the bosom, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Now, this goes back into the deity of Christ, which Greg covered exhaustively and wonderfully in our first in our first week on the book of John. If you didn't see that, I encourage you to go back. It's in the archives. Go back and watch the thing where Greg taught through the deity of Christ. It was the most complete I've ever heard it taught. Um, okay, Matthew chapter 3 and verse 16. It, it talks about, about how God declared that Jesus was his son. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were open unto him, and the Spirit of God descended like a dove, lighting upon him, and lo, the voice of heaven, a voice from heaven saying, This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. So God has, it says, hath declared him. God declared that Jesus was his Son. Uh, verse 19. And this is the record of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? Now, remember what we're doing. We get, we get into the small, but let's go back to context. Okay, We get into enjoying things like mercy and truth, but let's get back into context. John is talking, John, St. John is talking about John the Baptist teaching and how it relates to Jesus Christ. So he's not trying to illustrate step by step what took place. He's going to jump right into a, a piece of talking about who was John, who did he say he was, so that he can go back to his core truth, which is this is the Christ, believe on him and have eternal life. Okay. Um, so the, the Pharisees came and they asked John, and they said, Who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I'm not the Christ. Wouldn't that be nice to be mistaken for Christ? <laughs> it would be Imagine very nice. Imagine if you're out there preaching the word and doing what you're supposed to be doing, and everybody thinks you're Jesus. I mean, that says a lot about how the character of John the Baptist. Why what do you, do you think, think it was, though? Why? What I think what was? Why do you think that they thought he was the Christ? Was it the camel hair, the locust, the honey, the preaching? I think. I all, mean, there's been some wild prophets. Yeah. You want to go to the First Kings? That, no, no, not the whole thing yet. No, we don't have right. time for that. Well, go ahead. Well, if we if we look at some of the prophecies surrounding the coming of Christ, he was they had a they had a date line, because from the going forth of the commandment to right. rebuild the temple, they, they had four hundred and eighty three years. I think it was. They had four hundred and eighty three years between the going forth of the commandment and the coming of the Christ. So they know. Okay, he should be here. Remember the guys that were uh, with Herod? They said, uh, hey, the Christ is supposed to be here. And he goes, where, where? And they go, oh, let's check the scripture. Oh, Bethlehem. It says it in Micah. Okay, he's coming to Bethlehem. Okay, he's supposed to be here now and be in Bethlehem. Well, John was too. John was one of the only people that were from close to there, and he was close to Christ, and that's why they, they questioned him. So they come and say, are you the Christ? And he, he confessed, and then, no, I'm not the Christ. And they ask him, then what are thou then? Art thou the Elias? And he saith, I am not. Art thou the prophet? And he answered, no. So they go, okay, we want to find out. Here's a chance for John to make a name for himself. Here's a chance for John to build a mega church in the desert in Jordan with all the bells and trimmings and a big thing coming. Here's the chance, right? John's got the chance. Who are you, the Messiah? Mm -mm. Are you the Elias? Well, he came in the spirit of the Elias. That was prophesied by his father from the beginning. He has a chance to say, nope, I'm not. Are you, the, uh, are you a prophet? Nope. That prophet. Are, are the you that prophet? prophet? Yeah. Moses. Nope, I'm not. Well, why not? Why wouldn't he say that? Because he said he must increase and I must decrease. Then they said unto him, Who art thou, that we may give an answer to them that sent us? And what sayest thou of thyself? Now, if we look at the Pharisees, they come with a loaded question. Always yeah. they're coming with loaded questions. So they've come and they said, who are you? Are you this guy? If he says yes, then they're going to use it to say, okay, then this is, the, are you this guy? Nah. Are you this guy? Nah. I'm not going to fall into, the, into your categories that you're giving us. So they go, okay, fine. 
Who are you? Just tell us who you are so we can go back and tell, tell the Pharisees. And he said, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness to make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. Well, that's just irritating to them because they just asked him if he was the Elias. And he says, no, I'm not. Are you that prophet? No. Who are you? I'm the one that's in the wilderness to make it's the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Well, he was quoting Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord to make straight a desert highway to make straight in the desert a highway for our God. That's talking about the Elias, which is to come. It's a pro they all knew that. He knew that. Everybody there knew that, but he wouldn't say, I am the Elias. What he would say is, I'm fulfilling this prophecy. And so I'm sure it, it bugged the Pharisees to no end. I love John the Baptist. Okay, verse 24. And they which were sent of the Pharisees, and they which were sent were of the Pharisees. And they asked him, and said unto him, Why baptize thou then, if thou be not the Christ, nor Elias, neither that prophet? Now, they were ready with this. They're not the Pharisees. They were sent from the Pharisees. The Pharisees, okay, go ask him this. And if he answers this, ask him this. And then, so they, they have him all prepped. So, he didn't fall in their category, but they said, uh, okay, he didn't, okay, then we're going to ask him. So they asked him, they said, they asked him, why baptize if you're not the Christ, nor the Elias, neither that prophet? Well, here's his chance to preach repentance to them, right? Here's his chance to preach, prepare the way of the Lord and Messiah is coming. But he doesn't. Why not? Because that's not what they came for. They didn't come to repent. They didn't come to prepare for the Lord. They came for power. They came to assess the power structure that was and to get ready and to gain power. And John answered, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you, among you whom ye know not. He it is who is coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoe latchet I am not worthy to unloose. These things were done in Beth Abera, beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. Now, John, St. John, I'm only calling him that to make show the difference. It talks about this and, and lays down this because of how it relates to who Jesus is. So he says, this is what John said when they came to ask him. He didn't, he didn't confess to being the Elias. He did confess to fulfilling those specific prophecies. And uh, he gave them an answer that they didn't come for. The answer that he gave them was, there's one out there whose shoe latches I'm not worthy to unloose. He didn't give them any material to work with, to gain power to, to politic with. The only thing he gave them was a chance to repent. Do you see how he did that? Um, and so uh, they, uh, they, they, they go back and they're unhappy. And then um, the next day, and John isn't, remember, he's not trying to go categorically in line, in, in order. He is uh, hitting high points. When he says the next day, he's not saying the next 24-hour period, the following morning. Right. He's saying, okay, the next day that we pick this story up, the next time that we're talking here, this is the next day. We'll see why that's done that way in a minute. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said... After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore I am come baptizing with water. John says when Jesus comes, he's baptizing him. He turns around and he goes, that's him. That's the Messiah. That's the one I'm waiting for. Not only is he the Messiah, I didn't know he was the Messiah until just now. I wasn't aware of it until, until I just knew there was one coming, and I've been preparing, saying, there's one coming. I didn't know he was here until just now, but I saw him, and the Spirit of God said, that's him, that's the Messiah. Guys, it's time to stop looking at me. It's time to look at the Messiah. That's the Messiah. 
Verse 32. And I knew him not. Yeah, okay. verse 32. And John bear record saying, I <clears throat> saw a spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him is the same is he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. Now, we have this story recorded elsewhere. John's baptized him, and he turns around, and he sees Christ, and he says, I can't baptize you. I can't do it. I don't deserve to even untie your shoes. I'm not worthy. Jesus said, nevertheless, to fulfill all righteousness, you need to do it. And John said, man, okay. Now, if you are going down to the river with a bunch of sinners and you tell them to repent, you're preaching, repent of your sin because the Messiah is coming. And God Almighty in flesh walks down and says, I want you to baptize me in your baptism of repentance. How do you feel? I mean, what do you do? I can't baptize you with repentance. You don't need to repent. I need to be baptized with your baptism. You don't need mine. And Jesus says, no, to fulfill all righteousness. Can you imagine the humility that John felt? Can you imagine taking the Son of God and dunking Him in the water and bringing Him back out to fulfill all righteousness? I can't. I can't, I can't imagine the the humility that John felt there, the awe of it, the, the, the stirring movement, just, I, I can't imagine it. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Now John doesn't go into, St. John doesn't go into this very much because it's not relevant as much as what John it, John's experience isn't relevant what John said that this is the Christ that's the only thing that's relevant here so that's what he says and again the next day John stood and and two of his disciples now we see it says the next day if we look at the other passages where it talks about this occurrence when Jesus comes up out of the water he goes in the wilderness for 40 days, and he's tempted of the devil. Where John is baptizing him is in the wilderness, so Jesus stays there 40 days. He's tempted of the devil. John's still baptizing. For the next month and a half, he's still baptizing. And he's there, and two of John's disciples are there, because there's hundreds of people coming. So they're, they're baptizing, they're, and they go, hey man, repent! Because the one John's over here, and he's the one coming, and he says, "Repent! You need to repent." This is his disciples, and they're baptizing, and Jesus walks by. John turns around and he says to his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, "Behold, the Lamb of God." When when John sees Jesus walks by, walking by, he 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 grabs his boys. Hey guys, hey guys! There goes the Lamb of God, yep. and his his two disciples there with him. And his two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Remember what John said? John said, he must increase, and I must decrease. John just de decreased two disciples. He said, uh, no, no, we don't need this. You guys, that's the Lamb of God. Go follow him. You know, another lesson you can get out of this right here is in verse 37. It says, and two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. This wasn't in a church. Okay, this was open air. This was on a hillside or by the riverbank somewhere or something. This is a public outdoor ministry, okay? Jesus got his disciple, two disciples right there, bam. But that, let's learn from this. When you're out there, <clears throat> out and about, don't expect people just to come to you and say, I want to be your disciple. You know what you have to do? Well, what was Jesus Christ doing? <laughs> okay, he was preaching, okay? Another thing is, is that uh, you don't always get your disciples from church or whatever, okay? It's an open-air public ministry, and that's the, his first two disciples were gotten right there. I also never trust a man who wants men to follow him. I never will trust a man that says, I want you to come and sit at my feet and minister right. under me. I will, I, I've, known, I've known plenty of them, and none of them had the anointing of God. None of them followed the Spirit of God. I'll trust a man that says, come here, 
sit under my feet, and I want you to learn the Bible, to learn how to study it so that I can get rid of you and that you can go out and teach somebody else. And I don't want you. I don't want you under my authority. I don't want you to answer to me. I don't want you to come back and, and, and later on when you have a question, come back for me to dictate what you should do. I want you to go follow the Lamb of God, not me. That's the way a man of God should act. When you see a guy start heaping unto himself disciples <clears throat> and wanting to keep them, wanting to, wanting to always come back and answer to him, yeah, go start another church, but twice a year you need to come back and, and talk to me about it and, and give me an update so I can decide what you should. No, it shouldn't be that way. So two disciples hear it, and they walk off and they follow Jesus. And Jesus turned and saw them following, and saith unto them, What seek ye? And they said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted master, where dwellest thou? So Jesus is, is walking along there, and these two guys follow him. John just called him the Lamb of God, but he may have only told, told a couple people. And, and Jesus is walking along, and there's two guys right behind him. Jesus goes, What you looking for? What are you seeking? And they said, Where are you staying? We want to come to your house. Now that's that's a that's a big that's a big thing right there that they're seeking God. Now um, we should seek God, and it's a it's important enough that that we've studied it out here and 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 looked at what a Christian should seek and shouldn't seek, and what these guys should and shouldn't seek. Bob, go ahead and take right. five or ten minutes and and tell us about it. All right, so what we got here, there should be a PDF uh, file. I hope you, uh, you already downloaded that. There's maybe a dozen verses or so on there about, about seeking, just general stuff, nothing too tricky, nothing like that. All right, so uh, we're going to start out right here in John 1.38. It says, And Jesus turned and saw them following and said unto him, What seek ye? Jesus said, there's two guys right there. He says, what do you want? What's going on? You know, or modern day, be like, what's up? You know, what, what seek ye? Okay, and that's not a Japanese uh, dish, okay? It's what siki, not wasiki, okay? All right, so what we're going to do right here is, uh, let's look over it. Well, no, don't turn there. The Bible says, by wisdom, the world knew not God, okay? So what you got to be careful of is all this Bible knowledge and all this wisdom you get. You know, the devil knows the Bible better than me or you. You know that? But it, it's, it's the heart. That's what we're going to focus on tonight, is your heart and, and seeking God. You know, all this, uh, this is really, really good, lots of information here. But if, if we, you know, take our time, you take your time, and we learn all these information, all these facts about, you know, Genesis and, and John the Baptist and the light and the justification and the redemption, all this stuff. And then at the end of the day, it's like, okay, let's, uh, what, what, what do we do tomorrow? Okay, the thing is, do something with it. Okay, um, be not hearers of the word, but, but doers only. Okay, you have a heart problem in Genesis uh, chapter 6, verse 5. It says, The imagination of the heart is only evil continually. And then again in uh, Genesis 8 21, it says, Even from his youth, okay, from when you're a little kid, your heart is wicked. Okay, you have a wicked heart. That's, that's the problem. All right, um, Matthew uh, chapter 6, verse 21, it says, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Okay? What do you seek? What are you seeking? Okay? That's the question. Where's your heart? You know, uh, you can always tell by where a person's heart is, but what they talk about. Okay? The Bible says, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Whatever's in your heart is going to come out one way or another. You know, I'm around people all day, every day, and here's what it is. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's fishing. The fish biting, the river, the boat. Uh, Jesus Christ says, be ye fishers of men, okay? It, it's hunting, it's trucks, it's tires. All the talk is the, the TV show they watched last night. It's, uh, it's cars, the nice car, the gas mileage, the gas prices, okay? The, the Facebook this, Facebook that. Uh, more ways to make more money, more ways to retire next year, or retire when you're, you know, whatever. It's, uh, it's Hollywood, you know, all the the gossip and the Hollywood and the stars and this person, you know, was in jail and that person did cocaine or whatever. And, and it's all about this. What? It's like, whoa, you, are you even a Christian? All you talk about is all this stuff that doesn't even matter. You, sometimes I try to have a conversation with people 
hey, what do you think about that, that verse, you know, in Genesis 6? Or what, do you, what do you think about that verse, you know, where it says, you know, the spirit descended upon Jesus Christ like a dove? I didn't know you could see a spirit. And they're like, oh, uh, well, uh, anyway, uh, I got a boat coming next. It, it's all, it, you can't hold, hold a conversation with people. Most people to have a spiritual conversation lasts about 30 seconds, with, with me anyway, okay? Because their heart is not on eternal things. Their heart is on the earth, okay? You have a heart problem. Um, Jesus says, what do you seek? He said right here to uh, Andrew and Peter says, what do you seek? Now, the question is today, what do you seek? Okay, what are you seeking? All right? All right, what do you seek? Um, wherever you seek, there will your heart be. Okay, there's a few things you do not want to seek. Carnal things, Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12 and verse 29. It says, and seek not ye that which, uh, and seek not ye what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of the doubtful mind. For all these things the nations of the world seek after. And your father knoweth that ye have need of these things. Okay? You know what? Don't be so worried about the day-to-day -day stuff. You're a child of God. You think he's going to let you starve to death? You know what? He feeds the birds, the, the lilies, they toll not where they spin. Okay? You know, don't be so consumed with the cares of this world and, and this bill and that bill and the car. And just, you know what? Seek God. You know? And all these things will be added unto you. All right? Uh, let's turn over to Numbers. Numbers chapter 15, verse 39. Numbers chapter 15, verse 39, it says, And it shall be unto you a fringe, that ye may look upon and remember all the commandments of the Lord, and do them, and that ye seek not after your own heart, and your own eyes, after that which ye used to go a whoring. You know what the Bible says? Don't seek after your own heart. Your heart's wicked. You know what? Go after the Lord's heart. Go after what's eternal. Go seek eternal things, okay? Now, another one here is in Galatians 1.10. It says, For I do persuade men, or for do I persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. If you're always out there trying to be a people pleaser, you are not serving Jesus Christ. Okay? You are not serving Jesus Christ if you're just out there trying to please people like the big mega churches. Okay? All right? Now, there's a couple of things here that you... That you um, that you do want to seek, okay? The Bible says in Matthew 6, 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you, okay? Seek God with the right motive. Over there in John chapter 6, verse 26, I got just a couple more little verses here, and we'll wrap it up here. John chapter 6, verse 26, it says, uh, And Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Ye seek me not because you saw the miracles, all right? but because you did eat the loaves and were filled. That's like the person that goes to church because it's a potluck or because it's a free meal, but they don't really care about the preaching, okay? Yeah, that's a wrong motive, okay? You know, be careful with your motive when you, when you serve God, when, you do, when you're seeking God, okay? What's your real motive? If you want to serve God, what's your, what's your motive? Is it because you want to be seen or, oh, so-and-so is doing something now, he's spiritual. What's your motive? Are you, are you doing it for the Lord or are you doing it to be seen, okay? Keep your heart and the last thing I want to say right here is keep your heart and minds on things on high. Okay, Colossians chapter number 3. Colossians chapter number 3. Verse 1. If ye then be risen, oh wait, if ye then be risen with Christ, if you're saved, you're born again, you are risen with Christ. Okay, commandment right here. Seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth in the right hand of God. Okay? Seek the spiritual, eternal things. You know what? This life is like a vapor, and when you die on your, on your deathbed, you are not going to wish you would have had a bigger house. You're not going to wish you would have had a faster, nicer car. You're not going to wish, you know what you're going to wish? That you would have really done some great work for the Lord, that you can put your finger on it and say, you know what, Lord? I might not have had all these things, but at least I did this for you, and I knew that's what I was supposed to do. You know another thing right here? This is tie us right back into, uh, into John. You know what? Peter and Andrew, they sought Jesus Christ. They, seek, they, they were seeking him. And guess what? They found him. And the Lord says, hey, come on. Come on over. Come to my house. You know, let's eat and drink. Let's, have a, let's talk about some things. You know what? My mom and dad were seeking for years and years and years about how to get saved. And, uh, and you know what? They got saved finally. <laughs> 
they had the Jehovah Witnesses, they had all these cults, they had all these weird, trying to figure out all this stuff. And you know what? They were, they were seeking and they got saved and boom, they got saved. I got saved. My whole, we're all saved because we were seeking the Lord, okay? So seek ye first the kingdom of God and don't be so distracted upon, uh, you know, where's your heart? That's the question. Where's your heart? Okay? And I'll go right back to you, Nathan. Man, that's a good word. Um, I remember when uh, his, his folks got born again and uh, they, they got to, they sought God, man, in their testimony. They were seeking God in some weird places. But uh, he, his dad actually called Israel, trying to get a rabbi to try to figure out. He, he called Israel and they're like, the directory, who, how yeah. can we direct your call? He's like, I want to talk to a rabbi. They're like, what rabbi? I don't know. I just want to talk no, to like, a rabbi. He, I remember I was, I was right there by the phone. And it was like $10 a minute. You know, it was like, yeah. his mom's like, get off the phone, get off the phone. And she's like, that's like, you know, he ran across this verse, Acts 2.44. They held all things in common. Is that like a socialism verse, you know? He's, he's like, Acts 2.44, Acts 2.44. And they're like, eggs for 2.44? You know, the eggs for 2.44? He was, yeah, he was just searching, you know? But you know what? Yeah, and he, and he searched with the Amish. <laughs> He, uh, he looked for all, all kinds of stuff, and he ended up in this uh, dingy little house with a bunch of different people trying to give different ideas, and somebody came and preached the gospel, and they received it and were excited about it and got born again. And not just him, but his, his whole house. And, and it's stuck, and they've changed, and uh, uh, seek God, and you'll find him. And the neat thing about this seeking God is when are you done? Never, never are you done. Seek God first. Seek Him early. Seek Him now. Seek Him and you'll find Him. Yeah, another thing, God doesn't play hide and seek. Okay? <laughs> if you're seeking, he, he, and you, will, you will find Him. Here's another good thing. It, the, one, the verse you read in Matthew, where He says, yeah. Seek ye first and all these things will be added. He, but yeah. he said, beginning, He said, Don't seek food. Don't seek riches. Don't seek clothes. Seek first the kingdom of God, and all those things will be added unto you. Yeah. You seek God first, and that stuff. Now you and, hear all the all the time today, man. If you get saved, you're going to have prosperity. You just yeah. actually give us a hundred dollars, and you're going to have prosperity. The more you give, the more you get. Uh, you know what? No, you're seeking prosperity. You're yeah. not seeking the kingdom of God. You're seeking the kingdom of you. Yeah. Another thing that this Matthew six thirty three, the kingdom of God is the, the first time it's mentioned in the Bible. Yep. It's a, it's a spiritual kingdom. Okay. I've got 11 minutes to finish 11 verses. Oh, 12 verses. I'm not going to make it. Um, so Jesus says to the disciples, he goes, what are you seeking? And they said, well, Rabbi, or Master, where are, you, where are you staying? And he saith unto them, come and see. And they came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day. For it was about the tenth hour. Now, we were talking about this earlier, and Bob goes, how would that be to, to spend the day in the house with God, like talking to God, to Jesus, to, to go, you know, hey, man, come over to my house, and we'll sit on around the couch. We're going to have supper together. We're going to uh, spend some time. We're going to talk about the, the, the prophecies. We're going to talk about, I don't know, fishing. Uh, just yeah. talk to Jesus for a day. How cool would that be? Yeah. And, they, and it started by them just following him. He didn't ask them to. He didn't prompt them to. He didn't tell. They're just following. And when they're following, he gives them direction. And that direction is to come to his house. That's a cool thing. And one of the two which heard John spake and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, We have found the Manassas, the Manassas which being interpreted the Christ. So... Andrew runs out to his brother. What do you do when you find Jesus? What's the first thing that you do? Man, I found Jesus. Yeah. Go get your brother and bring him over. Get your family and bring them over. Tell them, I found the Messiah. I found Jesus. Yep. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas. Cephas, which is... Yeah. Which is by interpretation a stone. Jesus lays eyes on Peter for the first time in, in Peter's life. He looks at him and goes, Hey, you're going to be called a stone. Why? Why would he say that? Why would you say that to somebody the first time you meet them? Because you know who they are. 
because you recognize them and what they're going to be. When Jesus saw Peter, he saw his church. He saw his own church. He saw the, his, his church growing. He saw Acts 2.38, Acts 3, Acts 4. Jesus saw Peter and what Peter was going to do in the church. Jesus saw who he was going to be. When you meet Jesus, he will tell you, he will treat you like who you're going to be, not who you are. Peter's a fisherman. Jesus says, you're not a fisherman. You're a stone. You're a rock that we're going to, you're going to be a pillar in this church. It's good, it's good to be, know the Savior. The following day, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip and saith unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was, was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. So it says the following day. It may be the following 24-hour period. It, it, it looks like it is because it's just following and not the next. Um, and so now he has, he has four people now. And Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So he runs out and tells somebody else. You see how this works? You know what we call this? Evangelism. You know why it doesn't work too well today? Because nobody runs out and tells anybody else. You've got to run out and tell them. Um, and he says... He says, we found, just verse 46, we found, or 45, we found Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Verse 46, and Nathanael saith unto him, can there anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip saith unto him, come and see. And he says, uh, man, can anything good come, I mean, that's a podunk little hick town. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And he says, come and see, man. Come and see for yourself. Don't take my word for it. Come and check us out. And Nathanael, and Jesus saw Nathanael, verse 47, Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him, and saith unto him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Now, Jesus looks at, at Nathanael and says, This is who you are. How did Jesus know that? Because he knew all things, because he had... But what does Nathanael think? <laughs> He's buttering me up. <laughs> And Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? I'm not going to take it. <laughs> you can't butter me up. I know. I read Proverbs. Flattery spreads a net for the feet. He says, uh, Huh, how do you know me? Saw you under the fig tree. And he said, Whence knowest thou me? And Jesus answered to him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael goes, That was three hours ago. I was sitting under the fig tree pondering who the Messiah was. I'm making that up. But there was something significant about that. So Nathaniel's sitting under this fig tree, and he's thinking, I wonder when the Messiah... Daniel said it was going to be 400... How many years has it been? He should be here. He should have been here for like, I don't know, 30 years or so. wonder where he's at. I want... And then he's doing... And Nathaniel comes by. I mean, uh, uh, Andrew comes by and says, Hey. So he comes back, and he says... Uh, how do you know me? And Jesus said, when you were under the fig tree thinking about who the Messiah... Yeah, I knew you then. Wow. Nathaniel's blown away. And Nathaniel answered and said unto him, Rabbi, which remembers Master, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Yep. What a declaration. To go from, uh, how do you know who I am? I saw you under the fig tree. You're, you're the Son of God. You realize what a... What a leap of faith this is for Nathaniel. He was primed to believe this. He was ready to accept the Son of God. And there's something significant that was happening under that fig tree, something right. he was thinking about. Nathaniel's heart was prepared. Later when the Pharisees come and say, Who are you? And Jesus gives them, Why, why not? Why aren't they? Because their hearts are different. Because they don't have the same thing going on inside of them. Remember... It says, they heard just like we did. But it didn't do them any good because the things they heard wasn't mixed with faith. They weren't mixed with faith. He was ready for it. He says, verse 51, And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, 
and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Oh, I missed a verse. Verse 50. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Because thou said unto me, I saw thee under a fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt seek greater things than these. For I say unto you that hereafter you'll see the heavens open and the angels descending upon the Son of Man. So he says, you, you believe I'm the Messiah because I knew what you were thinking under the fig tree. But hereafter you're going to see heaven open and angels come down on the Son of Man. Later on that prophecy is fulfilled. Jesus knew at this early stage, he knew what was going to take place. He knew what would happen, where his end was, and what was going on. And he prepared his disciples for this. And uh, it was a... Uh, it was a moving experience for Nathaniel to know that Jesus knew who he was before he met him. But he said, yeah, that was moving, but join me and, and you're going to see a lot more than this later on. Now, the first chapter took us three weeks to get through. There are 22, 23, 22, 23 chapters in the book of John. 21. 21 chapters in the book of John. <clears throat> so roughly seven years. And we'll, um, we're going to pick up a lot of, when we get further down, there's going to be a lot of story. Right here in the first, John is preparing um, the doctrine. He's telling you what he's going to say. They say when you're speaking, tell somebody what you're going to say, what you've just said, or what, you're, what you have to say, and what you just said. To, 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 so... John's preparing us. He's telling us what he's going to say. He says, here's what I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that if you believe on him, you'll have eternal life through his name. That's what I'm going to teach you. That's what we're getting ready to do. When he gets done, he says, I wrote this book so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, and that believing you might have life eternal through his name. So this is, he's been telling us what he's going to say, and he's, he's weighed in on some heavy topics. Who is the Christ? Who is Elias? How does the how where does his disciples so he's but now we're gonna start we're gonna start picking up a little speed we're gonna get into some stories it's gonna be light but exciting and fun and some of my favorite favorite stories in the book of John like uh well, one of my favorites is I think it's chapter nine where where the blind man gets healed of his vision and and the Pharisees come and go ah oh, how are you you know healed and he goes Jesus of Nazareth who is he he says why well, herein is a marvelous thing that he's healed my eyes, and yet you don't know where he's from. <clears throat> and he's just, uh, the tongue-in-cheek, it's just hilarious. The story of the um, Christ when the, the, he puts the, heals the guy where the water it would, would tremble and, and people would get healed, and the Pharisees get all mad, and, and Jesus talks to him. Um, and then, of course, the crucifixion story in the book of John is, is so full of the emotion that you feel from from a disciple that loved God, Jesus so well, it is, uh, it's moving. It is, it, it changes you. It changes your heart. Now, uh, if you're watching the, this as an archive, um, be sure to, to try to join us live. Um, the reason is we didn't get a chance to do much tonight, but we really would like to get people to, to write in and ask us some questions, to say, you didn't explain this, I didn't understand, go back over this again, ha, I disagree with you on that, check this verse out. We really want some input. This is not a show, this is a Bible study between us and you. You are, are, are having a Bible study with us, and so it's not us having one with you watching, you need to be involved, otherwise this stuff won't stick. I hope you enjoy it, but if you really want to, to get into where you should be with this, you need to be involved with this. Be studying along with us. Be looking at stuff. Be agreeing or disagreeing on some stuff. So try to join with us every, every weeknight, I mean every uh, Sunday night at, uh, at 6 o'clock. And uh, also we will be taking off April the 24th on Easter weekend. Um, and uh, so bear with us as we are, as we are gone for uh, that week. But uh, we're going to try to be here every week and be broadcasting live. If you miss us live, then, of course, we're going to keep archiving things so that you can uh, 
go back and catch up to where we're at. All right. Um, do we have any notes this week or anything that we need to uh, do as we sign off? All right. Um, if you've never led anybody to the Lord and you don't know how to start, start. And then you'll have led somebody to the Lord eventually. Get out there and tell somebody. Get out there and give your testimony. If you're not sure what your testimony is, listen to somebody else's testimony and get saved. Um, the... <laughs> The uh, once you start working for God, everything else is dissatisfying. Once you once you once you see somebody get changed, get their life changed, everything else is dissatisfying. So this week, where you work, where you where you live, where you travel, remember, get out there, find somebody who needs it, and stand up for what's right. Stand up and be a fundamentalist. And remember to contend for your faith.